Good evening, friends of the creaking door. This is your host to welcome you into the inner sanctum. Come on in. Come in, whoever you are, whatever you are, whether you're alive or dead. In fact, the deader you are, the more we like you. <laughs> oh, some of us have gotten the arts and crafts rage. You know, the urge to make and unmake things with our bare hands. Gadgets and copper, silver, and bone. <laughs> so striking they make your head roll. One character drove himself into such a creative frenzy, he worked himself right back into the grave. I won't tell you who or what he is, because sooner or later you'll surely be seeing him around. <laughs> And now for tonight's torment. Killer at large. Tonight's drama is the story of the short and unhappy life of a fugitive whose sullen face stares at us from hundreds of police posters. Read one. Mark Stribling wanted for murder. Warning. This man is armed and dangerous. Is he guilty? Let's get our answer from Mark Stribling. Not guilty. I was framed, but good. Could happen to anybody. Come home unexpectedly to the wrong kind of wife. Your key's hardly in the door when there's a scream. Shut! Helen! Helen! But it's all over for Helen. And for you, too. The killer's gone down the fire escape, and so... If you're the patsy, it's a perfect crime for the guy who pulled it. Your gun was used. The world knew there'd been bad blood between you and the missus. And there's an insurance angle. Mrs. Stribling is worth $10,000 to you dead. The cops won't forget that. There's enough circumstantial evidence to burn you. So you run. You don't face the music. You don't dare. You hide and drift all the time looking for Mr. Other Man. I found him. Six months and 10,000 miles later in a tourist town over the border. I found him in a club called the Casa Real. I got behind him and rammed a gun into his back. Who? <laughs> Guess who, Davis? Don't turn around and don't stop smiling. Stribling in person. I got a message for you from Mrs. Stribling. She wants you to join her as fast as you can go. Stribling, no, don't! The long chase was over. I'd gotten my man. I ditched the gun and got away without being identified. I'd won, and I'd lost. I was really wanted for murder now. I got off the streets into another club, one with a jukebox that talked the United States this time. I wanted to forget murder. I wanted to find a girl and find something to laugh about. And then one came in the door, a real looker. I watched like she'd picked her, just as I'd picked her. Hello. New York? Frisco. Stribling's the name I use. And you? Maxine. Fancy name. Can I buy you something? Coffee. Black. Black coffee for the lady, amigo. Thanks. Now, can I sell you something? Well, it depends. What are you selling? Blind packages, like this one. For you, special. And don't be fool enough to open it here. Fool enough? What's in it? Your hammer's in that package. The one you use nailing up coffins. In other words, Stripling, your gun. Is this some kind of gag? No. Where'd you get the gun from? Out of the ash can. I saw you throw it in. Why? That's a long story. Why? I want somebody to confide in somebody I can trust. Trust with what? I'll tell you some other time. 
Come see me tomorrow morning, room 110, the Hotel Chico. Bye now. I didn't wait for tomorrow morning. You don't when you're suddenly sitting on a keg of dynamite labeled Maxine. I followed her out instead and tailed her through the streets. I didn't have to tail her far, just about ten blocks to a club I recognized. The Casa Real. I'd run out of it only an hour ago. With a smoking gun in my hand. I didn't wait until morning to go to Maxine's room in the Hotel Chico. I went right to it to wait for her. To surprise her. I didn't bother going up the usual way. I went up by way of the fire escape in the back. I found room 110. But the window was sealed tight. I had to kick it in. <laughs> Inside, I found an easy chair and a deck of cards. I played solitaire. With my gun in my lap. Waiting for Maxine. Morning was an hour old when Maxine came home. She had a camera slung over her shoulder, a big one. Like she made picture taking a business. She saw me and didn't bat an eyelash. How's your solitaire game? I'm ahead. Don't you come home nights? I work nights. What else? With this camera... I've got the picture-taking concession in the cafe out. You, uh... You saw me shoot somebody in there? I did. Then you followed me out. That's how you came to fish my gun out of that ash can, huh? That's right. Why'd you really trail after me to return the gun? To get an idea across to you. What idea? That I own you from now on. Body and soul and gun. Here's my life insurance policy. A picture? Pop your eyes over it, killer. It's my life insurance and your death warrant. You were fast on the trigger in the Casarial last night, but uh, I work with a fast camera lens. How many prints of this have you got? Just the one you're holding. Doesn't flatter me. Where's the negative? In an envelope addressed to the police to be delivered if. If what? If a friend holding it doesn't see me around for a while and gets to think I've been murdered for taking pictures. What are you after? Money. Ever dream of having all the money in the world? Not enough to lose any sleep. Where do we get all this money? Deep into the interior. And from there, a week's climb on foot with a mule pack. Climbing Monte Muerto. Monte Muerto? That's a lot of climbing. The mountain goes up 14,000 feet. We'll climb it. Who's got all that money up there? An old hermit. An American originally. Ever hear of Teacher Jonas? Never. Neither had I until I went to a library. Teacher Jonas was a multi-millionaire Oklahoma oil man once. Back in 1914, before we were born, oil poured for him like rain from heaven. And then a plague killed his family, his wife, his mother, his daughter. Right after that, his only son committed suicide. Guy blows his top when hard luck piles on like that. Yeah, that's just what happened to Teacher Jonas. His mind cracked. Oh. So he took himself out of the world. He packed up and climbed out as high as he could get. Teacher Jonas came to Monte Muerto with everything he owned converted into cash, into gold. He's up there somewhere, dribbling an old lunatic of 80 with more money than he can count. How'd uh, you tumble to teach it, Jonas? Listening in on table talk at the Casa Real. A tramp pilot named Wiley Scott was boasting to a companion, a ship's cook from Veracruz named Genesee. Wiley was trying to get Genesee to stake him to provisions, a pair of mules, and a guide. How'd Wiley find out about teacher Jonas? He piloted a monoplane on a run from Tampico to San Jose in Guatemala plane developed engine trouble, and he had to make a forced landing. You can guess the rest. Uh-huh. How do we find Teacher Jonas? And while he got his plane repaired, he flew over Monte Muerto again and made a detailed map. Map making's his business. He carries the map in a pouch around his middle. Job number one scheduled for me, huh? I'm to get the map from Wiley. <laughs> 
Maxine laid out the strategy for surprising Wiley Scott. She was going to invite herself up, a decoy with me behind her. It worked just like that. Wiley opened the door. Nice of you to visit, Maxine. A real nice... Su- uh, close your mouth, Wiley, and get back inside. Inside. What do you want? Tell her, Maxine. The map of Monte Muerto. The map? Pull your shirt out and unbutton that money pouch. Sure. Drop it on the table. See if the map's in there, Maxine. It's in there. Look, you people, uh, I'll be glad to cut you in this more than enough for everybody. There's too much there for one man to keep Shut up. The lady says no deal. Now, stripling. No, 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 don't mind a minute. Oh. Picture that, will you? Since Maxine became a camera fiend, Stribling's become a horribly negative guy. <laughs> she caught him acting the killer and liked the show so much she ordered a repeat performance on Wiley Scott. The treasure of Monte Muerto. Now she's got him climbing the highest mountain. But let Stribling tell us what gives. Besides his mind... As he bushwhacks his way to the peak of Monte Muerto. We were about a day out with the wind in our faces, maybe 4,000 feet up Monte Muerto with 10,000 more to go. We had two mules along packing provisions. We also had a guide we bought ourselves in a village, a local character named Stefano, whose face spelled trouble. We needed him for map reading. But he'd need watching. Senor! Senor Stribling! Yes, Stefano. The wind blow like the hurricane. Better we camp here. Oh, and lose time? What's wrong with a little wind? Stefano's right. If we try circling that ledge, the wind will blow us off the mountain mules and all. We'll make camp here. In this marsh? Better than the ledge. At least here we're not exposed. Now try telling that to the snakes. We'll build a fire. Make camp, Stefano. Si, sí, senorita. The order of the day, huh? Get used to taking orders. And don't ever point your gun my way by mistake. Killing me is like committing suicide. We made camp and got a fire going. And within an hour, the wind let up as suddenly as it began. Monte Muerto was like that. And then riding out with the wind as it blew up trail toward the peak, came a shot. Hello! Hear that, Maxine? Somebody calling to us from down trail. Just let me listen. Hello! One thing, we haven't got the mountain to ourselves. That voice. I've heard it somewhere. Can you make out where and who? Yes. Yes. It's that ship's cook from Veracruz. Genesee. The one Wiley Scott was trying to get a steak from that night in the Casa Real. Must have seen the smoke rising from our fire. What do you suppose Genesee's on the mountain for? <laughs> one guess. He pumped Wiley Scott like you did, huh? And he's out to make it in his own like we are. But... He doesn't make it, ain't I seen? When he appears, you order me to give him what Wiley got. No. Not when he appears. Not with Stefano here watching. You go down to Genesee instead. I hurried through the brush. And then after a ways, I slowed down. Stalking. Like a hunter stalks. There was no sound now except birds screeching. No sound of Genesee. And then, all of a sudden, I heard all the sound Genesee had in him. Help! He was screaming somewhere Help! in the trail, screaming like a guy gone crazy with fright. Help! I cut the direction of the screams as fast as I could go. I reached to where Genesee figured to be. But there was no Genesee. Only a pack mule at the edge of what looked like a shimmering bed of hot sand. Quicksand. It looked like Genesee had fallen in. All that was left of him was a hat sitting on the edge. But as it turned out, that was what Genesee wanted me to think. Stop! Stop! I came to... My left hand smashed where a bullet had burned into it. And Genesee, looking down on me, 
He'd been squatting in the brush with his rifle aimed and ready. You're not very bright, my friend. You fool easy. That hat on the edge of the quicksand was only a stage setting. How could... How could you know I was coming down after you? All these field glasses. I saw you make camp up there off the ledge and then come down trail after whispering with Maxine. <laughs> I guessed you were coming down to kill me. Maybe not. Don't lie to me, my friend. I know Maxine. Roll. Roll? End of the quicksand. I ain't got any bullets to waste. Roll. Okay. Okay, if you want it like that. I rolled. Slowly. I was dumb, sure, but Genesee wasn't very bright either. Rolling, my good hand under me closed on the 38. A 38 in a shoulder holster. Coming up on the roll, a shot from the hip. Genesee never even knew what hit him. I got back to camp. Maxine was all smiles. She washed my hand and tied it up. Then we all turned in for the night. The last thing in my ears was Stefano snoring. And then the fever throbbing in my hand rose to my head and, and I passed out. I came to wondering why Stefano wasn't snoring anymore. It wasn't because he was awake, up in the bus, packing the mules like a guy making a sneak getaway in the night. I reached for my gun. No oh, gun. My gun was gone. I see you are awake, Senor Stribling. In a good face. Quiet. You are awake, the Senorita. Please do not do nothing foolish, Senor. Stefano does not want to harm you and the charming Senorita. What does Stefano want to do? To take the mules and himself to the Senor Teacher Jonas. What? <laughs> What do you know about Teacher Jonas? As much as you do, senor. You see, the senor Wiley Scott also tells Stefano everything when he asks Stefano to work for him. <laughs> He's a guide to the top of Monte Muerto. Adios, now, senor Stribling. I have a long way to go. Stefano had left us to what seemed sure death. Either starvation, one of those sudden quicksand beds, an animal, or a snake. But we kept pushing on, Maxine and me. Three nights and two days. With Maxine breaking into laughing jag after laughing. <laughs> now it's so funny. Ah, <laughs> you. The tender way you're keeping me alive and sick. I've got to keep you alive. <laughs> Even if it kills you to do it. <laughs> you hate me, don't you, Scribbling? I'll give you one guess. If you only knew where I'd left that negative. Oh, no. I'm keeping you alive, sure, just about. But that mud water you've been drinking and the rotten food, you'll catch yourself a fever on it sooner or later, and then you'll talk. You'll rave with fever, and before you know it, you'll let on where you left that negative. <laughs> when that happens, I'll kill you. But I had an exclusive on fever. My head was swimming in it. My hands... The hand Genesee shot, I wanted to cut it off. And then what seemed a half day from the teeth, we ran into Stefano again. Maxine saw him first. Excuse me. Uh, Look. Where? Up there, hanging from the tree. What? Stefano. It was Stefano, strung up by the neck and grinning like he knew the job was on him. I cut him down. The $64 question of who strung Stefano up was answered in a note pinned to his clothes. What does the note say? I'll read it to you. You're next, Stribling. And after you, our mutual Maxine. It's signed Wiley Scott. Wiley Scott? But I shot him through the heart and left him in a hotel closet. <laughs> his ghost. Took up where Wiley left off. Let me see that note. You've seen Wiley's handwriting before? Lots of times. Well, is it or isn't it? Yes. Wiley wrote this note. A dead man hung Stefano. You get to a point where you don't figure things out anymore. You don't think you just push on like we did to the top or die. And then not much further to go. Smoke. Smoke's coming from the chimney. There we are. It's Teacher Jonas' hideaway. 
We made it. Almost. We got a good quarter mile yet. Stibbling. What? Wiley's up there. Look through these field glasses you took from Jesse. See what I saw? Yeah. Wiley out front with a rifle standing side. <laughs> we made it, but we're licked anyway. We show, and Wiley, or his coast, shoots us down. No. We don't do it like that. I show. Wiley draws a bead on me. His eyes are on me. You find an approach behind him. With my bare hands, I only got one and hand. a rock. You kill Wiley with the biggest rock you can find. We tried it like that. Maxine stumbling into Wiley's view, then pulling a dead faint a hundred yards away. Me crawling on my knees and stomach from the rear with a rock. I waited until Wiley bent over Maxine, and then I see. When Wiley came around to consciousness, I had his rifle. Uh, I rose again, I guess. Uh, how'd you come back to life? That day in my room. You shot okay, but you only knocked me out. A concussion did that. I always wear a bulletproof vest. How'd you beat us up here? Shortcut I didn't indicate on the map. And the old man, Teacher Jonas, what'd you do with him? I don't see him. The old man's dead. He died this morning in his room. You killed him? Nah, I found him dying. Nothing special, only old age. Your money, what about his money? <laughs> That's a joke. Old Teacher Jonas told me I could have it if I wanted it bad enough. Seeing as he was dying without airs, he was a real old gentleman. He was crazy, you couldn't tell. Where'd he say he kept the money, Wiley? In an iron trunk in the kitchen. In an iron trunk in the kitchen. You take care of Wiley, Stribling. Maxine, wait a minute. Let her go, Stribling. She deserves what she's going to get. What she's going to get. What do you mean, what she's going to get? came down on Maxine. When the smoke cleared, Wiley told me what old teacher Jonas had told him. A booby trap tooled into the iron trunk. Open the trunk to steal the money and blow yourself up. I'm here on top of Monte Muerto with Wiley Scott. That negative, no doubt, is in the hands of the police by now. They're probably... Sweating their way up here. <laughs> Funny thing. I don't care anymore. I'm not worrying about being hot. There's pain shooting from my hand into every part of me. And you tell me, how many times can a man die? <laughs> Nothing like blowing your top in high places. Maxine and Stribling reached the peak, all right. The peak of insanity. <laughs> Poor Stribling's absolutely disinterested in that picture Maxine took of him now. He figures you can't hang a man for dying. <laughs> uh, Morrow? Oh, sure. I uh, copied this dilly out of an old edition of Callahan's catalog for climbers. Quote, sometimes the road up leads underground. <laughs> Pleasant dreams. Sanctum has been brought to you through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. <laughs> <laughs>